Fallout New Vegas is my personal favourite game in the series, and the one that rarely got me hooked. But it's missing one thing that I love in the newer games, and that's the ability to build a settlement in your own corner of the wasteland and truly get immersed in one of the coolest areas within this universe. Luckily, this game has an amazing modding community, and I just so happened to find a mod to scratch this itch, with Nipton Rebuilt. So now, I can take a town that's been destroyed in a bloody conflict, become the mayor, and rebuild it slowly into a thriving town in the wasteland through hard work and earning a truckload of caps. There's only one man for a mayor's job in a recent war zone, and that's Sheriff Lonesome Rhodes. Down on his luck and needing a new adventure away from California, he made the journey to Nevada after hearing about the legendary New Vegas Strip. And we begin our adventure on day one as he arrives in the small town of Good Springs. Spending the day learning about Dust Brahman from a strange old cowboy, and relaxing in the local bar. And that's where he hears about the unfortunate fate of a small nearby town called Nipton being completely destroyed. Day two, and looking for adventure, Rhodes leaves the town of Good Springs and heads in the direction of Nipton. On the way, encountering a couple of criminals who are easily taken out of his trusty magnum, and navigating through a sandstorm in the middle of the desert, before finally arriving at the desert rest stop of Nipton, which is still in flames from the attack it endured. And it just so happens the criminals who destroyed the town are still hanging around. After pulling out his gun, Sheriff Rhodes is ready for a fight, but the Legion leave him alive to spread the word of what happened here. Hearing noises inside the town hall, he heads in to encounter a horde of trained attack dogs, dispatching them as he works his way upstairs. Eventually, coming across an old Protectron, who declares us the new mayor after witnessing our heroics. All that's left now is to log onto the computer and officially register as the town's new mayor, and after I'm sworn in, take some time to review what can be done to rebuild this once great town. After a long day, deciding to relax in the office, before browsing the computer again for some entertainment. Day 3 arrives and the town is in need of a major clean up, so Rhodes heads out to check on the prisoners. But they're too far gone to save, so puts them out of their misery. He then spends some of the caps he's saved to hire some help to put out the fires in town, and clear out the bodies and rubble to avoid any issues with disease spreading. Day 4 is an early start to try and get some cheap improvements made, but everything costs a lot of caps and supplies. With just enough money to refurbish a small house, Rhodes gets the supplies and gets to work. By the end of the day, the board's been taken down, some furniture's been salvaged, and an odd woman who survived the attack has moved back in, with some domesticated rad roaches as pets. I don't think I'll be visiting here again anytime soon. Day 5 is an early start to head for Good Springs on a supply run, selling every piece of loot I could carry for caps to repair the town, and here in the town is about to be attacked, decide to hang around. Day 6, and I get to help in the town deal with its bandit problem, speaking to Ringo at the gas station, and then convince Sunny Smiles and the other townsfolk to get together to fight back the threat. Getting Trudy ready to jump into the action, getting armour from Chet in the shop, and medical supplies from Doc Mitchell, and finally, a high noon, the bandits appear in the distance as the town gets set up for its last stand. The next 20 minutes is a brutal battle, but this has a happy ending as all of the bandits are killed or retreat, and the friendly town of Good Springs is safe. And as a reward, I get to keep all of the loot, and even get given the key to the safe in the schoolhouse, which will all help me get the caps to fix Nipton. Day 7, and after returning to Nipton, Rhodes uses the supplies he bought to set up the new general store fixing the outside to look a bit more welcoming, adding in shelves and storage for stock, and outfitting a living quarters for a shopkeeper to use when hired. Not a bad place to shop if you ignore the dirt and flies. Day 8 is spent interviewing candidates for the new shopkeeper job, and after picking the least crazy, lending a hand to unpack the stock. Welcome to Nipton. I like what you've done with the place. Bad news, I'm currently your only customer. The only other resident sleeps all day, but we should have more residents on the way soon. And after a quick introduction, sell all of the loot from the Good Springs raid to bring up the cap balance for some more much needed town repairs. Day 9, and with survivors hearing Nipton is under new management, Rhodes gets to work on a new house, fixing up a communal dining area, a state of the art kitchen, comfortable and not mould ridden bedroom, and a lovely new bathroom. And on day 10, some interesting characters move in with a new business. Welcome to town, can I have a hot dog? Okay. Was there something I said? Looks like you've had a rough few years in the army. Thank you for your service. Just, uh, stay away from me, you smell a little bit. 
Day 11, and with the danger of future raids on the horizon, the day is spent refurbishing a doctor's office. Salvaging furniture for a comfortable waiting room, a kitchen which also doubles as the doctor's bedroom, and of course a state-of-the-art and pristinely clean surgery room. And on day 12, our friendly neighbouring town sends a doctor courtesy of Doc Mitchell to get the place up and running. Doc, welcome to town. Place doesn't look too sterile, I'd maybe get cleaning, but hope you enjoy your new home. Maybe change your clothes as well, doesn't look too inviting. Day 13 are wanting to encourage people to stop at Nipton on their travels. Rhodes cleans up the campsite, opening up a number of trailer homes to people needing cheap housing or a roof over their heads for a night. Of course, clearing out the pesky scorpion population to avoid any unfortunate deaths. And with the only entertainment currently being Dust Brahman Racing, repairs the playground. It's not much more exciting, but at least he tried. Day 14, and with caps running out, Rhodes decides to head to Vegas feeling lucky. Heading to Good Springs and admiring the view from the hill, before finding an odd looking collectible which might be worth some caps. After being chased by some rad scorpions, and passing a couple of folks warning of a creature called a Deathclaw, we eventually make it to the not so lovely Freeside, and an opportunity to win some lucky hands of Blackjack. Not before being welcomed by the friendly locals though, they seem rather feral in this part of town. Day 15, and after a rough night's sleep, head to the local shop to make some sales and then to the slightly nicer side of town to do some exploring. Not much to see apart from the nutjobs dressed as Elvis, but eventually end up in a casino. After exchanging the last of his caps, Rhodes gets to gambling, and it just so happens he's always been rather lucky. Spending the night and most of the next day winning hand after hand, until the owner seems to get a bit upset and threatens to break my legs if I don't cash out. Day 16, and with most of the morning spent gambling, Rhodes cashes out and decides to leave town before he gets in trouble but heads to the security checkpoint in the main strip to submit to a credit check, easily passing so he can visit on his next trip. Also a bit shocked to see a man gunned down in the street, but what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas I guess. And after a fun overnight stay, set off on the walk back to town to carry on the repairs. Day 17, and with Nipton becoming a popular rest stop, Rhodes sets up a small hotel in one of the abandoned buildings. With a repaired Mr Handy as the concierge, and a couple of small but extremely secure rooms, travellers can have a safe night's sleep, with a couple of home comforts like a semi-usable TV and the modern take on a hotel bathroom. Day 18, and with some spare caps and sick of sleeping in the office, Rhodes sets himself up a small living quarters in one of the abandoned buildings. With a desk to do his mayor duties and some workbenches, it's quite a nice place. And the bedroom is definitely a step up from the office couch. Just a shame the previous occupier mysteriously died after I visited. Days 19 to 21 are spent building defensive walls around town with the scrap that have been salvaged so far. With Nipton slowly becoming an attractive place to visit again, residents were worried about a repeat attack, and this should help keep the town protected. Day 22 started with more sales for the shopkeeper, getting rid of some of the loot from the previous out of town trips, before furnishing another house for residents to move into, with enough caps to outfit the spacious home with a large yet slightly dark bedroom, a nice living area, and a pristine kitchen for cooking wasteland delicacies. And some rather creepy tenants moved in. Oh god, you're creepy, aren't you? Hold on. Are you clones? Synths. Best not be synths, not welcome in this town. Day 23, and with plenty of talented people in town, Rhodes sets up a repair shop to make use of them. With outside crafting areas, a bedroom that doubles as a machine workshop which can't be good on the lungs, and a storage slash living room which hopefully the new robotic dog will enjoy. Just don't mention anything to those Elvis impersonators I borrowed them from. Day 24, and carrying on finding townsfolk jobs, Rhodes fixes up a shop for clothing. Just ignore the huge hole in the wall. With an assortment of clothes found in the rubble of town, there's a fairly large variety, and the shopkeeper also gets the very own bedroom, which isn't directly under the hole in the wall that lets every element inside. Day 25, and running low on caps, we journey to the Vegas Strip for some more gambling, taking in the sights on the first trip to the land of the rich. With a late arrival, Rhodes gets right into the fun dancing in the street and trying to impress the local ladies, before heading into Gamora for a bit of gambling, and chatting to locals in the wealthy in bar until the early hours of the morning. Day 26, and after spending the night failing miserably on the slot machines, Rhodes turns to his trusted blackjack, and proceeds to win hand after hand, 
get in the VIP treatment with clothes and even some 200 year old wine, before things turn a little bit sour and I'm banned from gambling because I'm winning too easily. After cashing out, I receive a message to go over the road to the Lucky 38 for a meeting. Rhodes meets with the mysterious Mr House, who offers him a chance to manage his casino, but that's turned down for now while the repairs to Nipton are finished. But who knows, opening this establishment back up could be fun. And before leaving, find a buyer for that mysterious snow globe, netting a tidy profit on a piece of junk from the floor. Day 27, and after returning to town flush with caps and missing the bustling New Vegas Strip, Rhodes renovates an old building into a tavern, featuring a piano for live entertainment, a jukebox if the singer is terrible, and a fully stocked bar, this place should be very popular. Just need to avoid those drunken shootouts to keep profits up. Day 28, and demand for housing is up, so Rhodes fixes up another abandoned house. Probably the best in town, as it features a robo-brained chef in the kitchen, and a very nice looking living area, and a bedroom which doesn't look like a dungeon. Day 29, and it seems town is becoming popular, as raiders turn up to try and cause some trouble. They don't put up much of a fight at the gate, quickly being gunned down, but do take over the abandoned casino building. After a brutal fight which lasts hours, they're all killed, and as a positive there's plenty of goods to scavenge from them, which can be sold and reinvested in town. Day 30, and with future raider attacks a possibility, Rhodes sets up a guard post at the front of town, and deputises some brave volunteers who form the start of Nipton Police Department. We won't back down from any fight now. Day 31, and with some weaknesses in the town defence, Rhodes sets up another guard outpost on the other side of town, including a small living quarters for the latest deputies. The force is looking strong now and should hold off attacks. Day 32, and with Nipton PD continuing to grow, it needs a headquarters, so the old train terminal outside of town is repurposed. An office is set up so investigations and admin can be conducted, and a living quarters and break room is put together for rest and relaxation. And of course, it wouldn't be complete without a cell, which just so happens to house a raider who is doing some scouting for another attack. Captain, I heard you found someone sneaking around the perimeter. I'll get some answers out of him. Well, well, well. Isn't this your lucky day? Day 33, and the final repairable house is fixed up for some new tenants. This house is a little bit dirty in the rest, but it's affordable at least, and the rent is very cheap as you can split it between four people. And you can even choose a top or bottom bunk. Days 34 to 37 are a bit of a blur but Rhodes headed to New Vegas to earn some more caps for the final repairs in town, which turned out to be a bit chaotic. First heading to the tops and seeing one of the worst suits known to mankind, and then spending hours upon hours sat at the blackjack table getting extremely lucky. So lucky in fact that after clearing the casino of five figures worth of caps, we're banned. Then nearly getting shot by a fellow cowboy after nudging him as I drunkenly walked into a tree and angering the poor fellow. Next on the casino list was the high-end Ultra Lux, spending a ridiculous amount of time again winning hand after hand, all while being offered some very odd taste and treats by the staff, certainly not like the Brahmin steak I'm used to, before eventually being banned for my excessive winning. With one final night, Rhodes had an evening swim in the Ultra Lux Legion style baths, which was a pleasant change of pace, before getting a bit too drunk and being escorted to the drunk tank for seductively dancing in the fountain out front of the casino. Day 38, and after heading home from New Vegas with some new friends in need of housing, Rose sets them up in one of the last buildings. They did have some odd requests though. The living room and kitchen were perfectly normal, but the bedroom was a bit on the raunchier side, with some very interesting decorative features. At least the bed looks comfortable. Sleep with LaBelle for 15 caps. Are you LaBelle? Uh, LaBelle Galette. I will pass on that. There is another ghoul in town you might get along with though. Enjoy the setup. Day 39, and with the campsite booming with new visitors and residents, it needs a security upgrade. So Rhodes deputises another couple of officers and sets up a guard post and a weak point of the fence. And adds a target range so officers can keep practising their aim. Day 40, and after his long Vegas trip filled with sin, Rhodes decides to fix up the local church. It's small and probably not going to get too much use out of this town, but it'll do the job. Downside is, I'm not a very good priest to have in charge. 
Day 41 sees another expansion to the defences at a weak point on the back road into town. With a police force of 10 deputies and a fully functioning HQ, Nipton is set up to avoid any damage in the future. Day 42 and with the final building untouched and missing New Vegas, Rhodes has an idea. Why not build a casino? And so with a couple of signs to encourage tourists, it's official and very nice inside, featuring a small bar, a cashier for gambling and a few tables to spend your hard earned caps, it's a nice addition to the town's economy. Day 43 and after a night of embarrassing himself in front of the townsfolk, Rhodes has completed the town repairs. Now a thriving outpost in the Mojave for travellers to stop and rest and a safe place for people to call home. But with a taste of opening a casino and missing the New Vegas Strip, maybe now is the right time to consider the offer from Mr. House and become a full-time casino manager. Fallout New Vegas is an iconic game, with the New Vegas Strip being one of the most memorable areas in any of the games I've played. I spent countless hours in the casinos losing until I realised my luck stat was terrible, admiring the detail in the area and unlocking every secret I could find, but I'd always wanted one extra feature to elevate the New Vegas experience. That feature is the ability to open and run your own casino. As the courier, you can influence the course of the game and take over the Lucky 38, so why can we not enjoy the benefits of that? Well, it just so happens I found a couple of mods to fix this issue. The New Bison Steve Hotel and Run the Lucky 38. Both of these mods let me redevelop these rundown casinos and turn them into profitable businesses which breathe brand new life into some neglected areas. And who better to take on the challenge than the hero of Nipton, Sheriff Lonesome Roads. After recently taking Nipton from a crumbling ruin and turn it into a secure town and popular rest stop, Rhodes hears about another town that has fallen on hard times. The resort town of Prim, which has fallen under control of recently escaped convicts. And so, on day one, Rhodes sets off to Prim to liberate the town. Warned by an NCR guard of the danger, he heads inside and gets attacked by Dust Brahmin and convicts, quickly dispatching them. With more danger inside the Bison Steve Hotel, Rhodes clears the hallways and fights a tough group of enemies in the main hall, just narrowly avoiding being turned into a barbecue and finishing the convict group's leader. With the hotel cleared of enemies, the captive Deputy Beagle is rescued and when safely outside, mentions the old sheriff was killed. But Rhodes can't be in two towns at once, so it's time to get some outside help. Day 2, and after recovering from the fight, here's about a sheriff who was wrongly locked up in the local NCR prison. So it's time to break into the prison and free the sheriff from the convicts who are now running it. Arriving at the prison, Rhodes takes out a few guards on the outside before a brutal shootout in the prison cafeteria. And thanks to his amazing luck, manages to avoid injury and clears the room. With the room cleared, we can finally speak to Sheriff Myers, who agrees to take on the prim job if we can clear his name with the NCR. And after a long walk, we arrive at the NCR base at the Mojave Outpost and have a meeting with Major Knight, who doesn't take much convincing that a new sheriff in Prim would help stabilise the region and pardons Myers of his crimes. With that job done, we give the good news to Sheriff Myers and Prim is safer, and Rhodes is free to get on with the rebuilding work. Day 3, and after investigating around town, we find a descendant of the owners of the Bison Steve Hotel, and agree to help with the restoration work with the promise of becoming a co-owner. The first step is retrieving some blueprints locked away in a safe. With the blueprints collected, there's a clear plan on how to turn this old hotel into a state-of-the-art wasteland casino. The first step is to get the lights fixed, and it just so happens there's an old order for lights which was never delivered, so it's time to prepare for a trip to the New Vegas Strip to collect. And while on the long journey to the Strip, now is a great time to like and subscribe, which massively helps the channel out. And I'm happy to announce the launch of the Veil vale Plays Games Discord, where you can chat about all things Bethesda with me and this amazing community. Day 4, and we arrive at New Vegas to pay a visit to the Gamora Casino, and a man named Nevada Slim, who never bothered sending the lights prim ordered. This dodgy looking fellow tries to double the order price, but with some shrewd bartering, we secure the lights for 750 caps. Day 5, and after arriving back in Prim, we help clear up the damage and dirt in the Bison Steve, installing some makeshift lighting in the entrance, and knock down a wall to open a huge room containing a fountain, which is just the place for a casino to be opened. Day 6, and with the lights ordered, we still need furniture for the casino. A mysterious middleman offers us some furniture from Vault 3. There is a catch though, it's infested with fiends and he wants a briefcase in the vault as payment. So, we head over to the vault entrance and clear out a few fiends, who are a bit too wasted to hit me, and head inside of the well-hidden vault. Luckily, the fiends inside aren't too clever, and I convince them I'm a courier delivering some jet and psycho, 
which let me walk straight past to the boss's office with no trouble at all, and for a few psychos, he's more than happy to let me take the briefcase. I quickly leave before they catch on to my tricks and head back to Prim. Day 7, and finally arriving back in town, I hand over the case asking no questions, Worth it for some custom furniture, and the lights we ordered are finally delivered to spend the day installing some fancy wall and ceiling lights. And even a custom chandelier which will be the centrepiece of the new casino room. Day 8, and with nothing to do until the furniture arrives, we need to address the issue that our casino has no kitchen. So head out to the location of an old tool shop near New Vegas, which unfortunately is inhabited by some robo-brains, so take them out for scrap parts. And after some searching, find kitchen grills which can be repurposed into a cooking station. Just ignore the green water they've been sitting in. Day 9, and after returning to Prim with the kitchen grills, we spend the day unpacking the furniture delivery, adding in comfortable seating in the hotel's main entrance, setting up a large restaurant with custom vault seating which just needs a kitchen to open, and adding in a bar area and extra seating in the large soon-to-be casino room. And it wouldn't be much of a hotel casino without a reception area. Day 10, and the casino is nearly ready for opening, but we find out the casino's custom chips were never delivered. After some digging, it turns out the shipment was hijacked by some ghouls. So, we head to the last known location outside of town, and spot a ghoul in the distance. Following it to its lair, which is infested with the now feral ghouls who stowed the shipment, a few kills and some radiation later, we find an old shack, with a killer robot and a long dead ghoul doctor, who just so happens to have stored away the custom chips we need, so we take them and get on our way. Day 11, and after sleeping off the radiation, we get to work on the restaurant kitchen, installing the newly refurbished grills which we're hoping won't irradiate every customer who eats here, and even manage to fit two clean water sinks which use filtered rainwater collected from the roof. Day 12, and Rhodes thinks the casino needs custom artwork and signage to help it compete with New Vegas, so heads over to the Strip to speak with a well-known artist in the area. The problem is, he's struggling for inspiration and is contracted to stay on the Strip, so we've got to take some pictures to help his imagination. Days 13 and 14 are spent travelling around various New Vegas landmarks to help our new artist friend. Starting at home with a picture of Bison Steve's current sign, followed by the Novak Dinosaur Thermometer, the Camp McCarran Neon Monstrosity, the most unappetising bottle of Sunset Sarsaparilla you're ever likely to see, and finally, the Helios 1 sign. Day 15, and we return to Michelangelo with the inspirational pictures, and he gets to work on our new artwork. We then head back to Prim and spend the rest of the day setting up the casino, with all of the usual games for customers to enjoy, as well as a bar which definitely won't encourage them to spend more caps. After setting up a lot of the town with new jobs, it's time for a small party, getting a bit too drunk at the bar. Day 16, and after drinking the last of the town's drink supply, we need to find a regular supplier, as well as some fresh food, and it just so happens that our new rich friends outside of New Vegas can help. We cut a deal for some of the profits to be shared for regular protected caravans to be set up to the area, hoping to stimulate the economy. Day 17, and after returning to Prim, the art has arrived. The outside gets some imported trees as well as lights to show the area isn't deserted, but inside is where it shines. Artwork adorning every wall to up the class, plants to add a bit more life into the room, the steakhouse gets its own custom sign, and the restaurant begins serving standout food in the wasteland. The casino is officially dubbed the Lucky Casino, but the casino room is where it shines with huge art pieces, full-size palm trees, and a custom fountain area which really helps make the casino stand out. Day 18, and needing a place to rest and work, a basement area is renovated into a living space with a comfortable sleeping area, a kitchen to prepare some quick meals, and a workshop area so building projects can take place away from guests, and I'm even treated to a new gun from our co-owner Steve. Day 19, and with the casino proving popular, we set up a gift shop. What trip wouldn't be complete without an overpriced piece of junk that stays forever in a drawer after buying it? And I'm even tempted by a new hat. I'll leave which one it is up to your imaginations though. Days 20 to 24 are spent fully refurbishing the elevator and the second floor into hotel rooms. With popularity soaring and travellers from all over stopping, the hotel rooms would add a huge amount of caps into the local economy. Bedrooms come standard with a double bed and ensuite, as well as a small sitting area. With the rooms complete, the hotel and casino is finished and Rhodes celebrates with some of the new customers. And why don't we have a fly through of the casino? Starting with the check-in area which is spacious and well themed, one of the best restaurants in New Vegas, probably because it's one of about five in the entire area, 
Takia's gift shop around to trap drunken patrons into spending everything they have, a spectacular casino and bar area filled with your favourite casino games, with a relaxing backdrop to encourage continued gambling, and a choice of slightly clean suites so you never have to leave the hotel. Day 25 and the casino is now earning 1000 caps every day through all of its operations, and it's safe to say Rhodes doesn't handle having free time well. Spending his first cut failing miserably at the poker table, I guess the house always wins, even if you own it. I think it's about time we get another project underway. Day 26, and after an overnight stay in Nipton restocking and catching up with the locals in the bar, it's time to head to New Vegas for another business opportunity. Mr House had offered a management position at the Lucky 38, and after he hears a courier is out to kill him, he decides it's time to sell. So for a cut price, we're now the proud owners of a New Vegas casino, and with our recent experience, can transform the place. The first stop is to check what work needs to be done before opening, and well let's just say, this won't be cheap or easy. Day 27, and it's time to get to work. First finding some Mr Handy robots in storage, and repairing them over the course of the day, which will look after the checking counter and the money cage. And officially opening the casino with a 1500 cap payment, so the house has some funds to lose if we get unlucky. Day 28, and we need some working slot machines to be a casino, but there's electrical problems everywhere and they aren't working. So we get to fixing the outlet for the slot machines, and get them turned on to help with running costs. Checking running costs wasn't a great idea, because we're currently in the red, and it's not surprising by looking at the casino. It's dirty, there's nothing going on, and the clientele are a bit on the creepy side. Luckily, we have a lot of potential upgrades available based on the blueprints and items we have in storage, they'll just cost a lot to complete. Day 29 is spent fixing the lights around the casino and enabling them to be turned on to the brightest setting. If it never goes dark inside, then customers won't feel the need to go to sleep and spend more gambling. Day 30, and it's time to do a deep clean of the place, getting the mystery stains out of the carpets and giving every surface some disinfectant. Who knows what went on in here before we took over. And with no bartenders, it's a long night serving drinks to the few customers we have, especially this one who hasn't left in days. Day 31, and it's time to dig the blackjack tables out of storage to help the atmosphere. Again, not cheap as the repairs to the Protectron dealers cost a thousand caps each, but at least the news is getting out that the casino is a fun place to be with a nice jump in attendance. And for the first time, we're making money, with 763 caps coming in daily to reinvest. Day 32, and the day is spent repairing a bartender Mr Handy, who requires no sleep, which is perfect for cost efficiency, and stocking the bar with some drinks and snacks, which don't last long, so we'll need to get a regular supplier set up. Day 33 is spent repairing another Mr Handy, so we can sell various completely legal chems. Luckily, the NCR don't care too much what goes on behind closed doors. But again, the stock is sold out very quickly. We also spend time repairing the jukeboxes around the casino to add some much needed atmosphere. Day 34, and needing a regular drink, food and dodgy goods supplier, we head back to Prim to check on the Bison Steve Casino. Talking to Steve to get another shipment contract set up that'll head to the New Vegas Strip, and collecting our share of the profit, which is proving to be quite the cap printing method. Of course, it'd be silly of me not to try and double the money I've earned. Well, maybe it was silly, as the dealer never seemed to lose. D35, and after an early morning walk of shame back to New Vegas, we take a relaxed day setting up the new shipments of booze and chems with the Mr. Handy cashiers, programming in the daily stock and cap prices. D36, and continuing to expand, the roulette protectrons are repaired and wheeled out to complete the casino's game expansion plan. Now there's something for everyone. But the success also attracts some unsavoury characters who manage to dig into the current vault room from a mole rat tunnel underground. Day 37, and with the casino attracting some high end customers, the VIP lounge is refurbished. With a private seating area overlooking the rest of the casino, and its own bar, it's a great place to entertain people willing to spend big. So of course, Rhodes spends the night sucking up to them in the hopes they'll drop enough caps to spend on the next few upgrades. Days 38 to 41 are spent fixing up another VIP area, the membership only room of the Studio Club, a place where big spenders can relax with complimentary food and beverages, fully refurbished pool tables, and plenty of seating to relax in between casino visits, and it'd be rude not to have a private office in this area to make use of the quiet during a hard day's work. Day 42, and with daily profit reaching over a thousand caps, there's plenty of capital to reinvest. 
so a clean-up crew helps Rhodes to renovate the first floor of the casino, which holds a number of rooms for overnight visits. It's still a bit on the filthy side, and guests are conducting questionable experiments in the room, so this might need more work. Day 43, and with the guests' alcohol still nearly exploding, the guests are removed and Floor 1 is renovated further to appeal to more cap flush guests. With a robot brain to keep rooms clean, and fully furnished rooms in a variety of styles, this should keep guests coming back time and time again for long stays. And it's already proven popular with some of the guests using the Studio Club Lounge. Day 44, and the bathhouse is cleaned up and repaired. Turned into a calm and relaxed environment to wind down after a long day. Equipped with a sauna and steam room, and a huge luxury pool which needs more repairs due to low water pressure, it's still a great looking area to take a break though. Day 45, and with an ever increasing number of guests, food is becoming an issue, so the kitchen is refurbished. With a large serving area, plenty of room temperature and cold temperature storage, and plenty of cook and space capacity to future proof the casino with enough food for any guests. Day 46, and the employee quarters are repaired so we can hire after running out of robot workers. Featuring a very comfortable lounge area to rest before shifts, a kitchen and dining area to eat away from the chaos, and a number of private rooms which will come complimentary to anyone deciding to take a job. Day 47, and needing a more relaxed time, Rhodes decides to interview for a dancer to attract in customers. There's just one criteria to be eligible for the job, beat him in a dance-off. And that's definitely not an easy feat. Day 48 comes around and expansion is causing casino-wide power outages, so we head to the basement to investigate. After looking into the issue, the nuclear generator was operating in low power mode, and the day was spent unlocking the additional power through opening a number of switches to allow unlimited energy to be produced, sharing the excess with the local area and freeside due to how advanced the generator is. Day 49 and more casino service rooms are refurbished to increase the experience. With a dedicated reception area for service requests from guests, plenty of capacity to keep the bedding and rooms clean with washer dryers, and even a security office fitted with some jail cells for when a customer needs to sleep off some alcohol in the drunk tank. Day 50 and the caps generated the starting to snowball, so we need to beef up security. A security room is outfitted to allow guards to move in and start keeping the casino safe, along with computer stations which will be upgraded with CCTV. Days 51 to 53 are spent installing CCTV which allow guards to keep an eye out for anyone trying to plan another casino heist, all from the safety of the security office. A turret is also installed above the main entrance which can be activated remotely whenever an issue is identified on the main casino floor. And the door to the armory is also cracked open and with a bit of luck is fully stocked with pre-war assault weapons and shotguns. Day 54 and the medical clinic is opened and a top robotic doctor is activated. With plenty of space for sick and injured citizens, we decide to open the clinic up as a free service to citizens in New Vegas and Freeside. It might not pay well, but a good reputation and a healthy population will help the city prosper. Day 55 and with tourists flocking to the casino, the Sky Lounge is repaired to add even more excitement. Eventually it'll be a world class restaurant, but for now it's a great place to relax in style and taking the views from the top of the tallest building in New Vegas. Day 56 and another members only club is opened called Studio 12 to cater for the increasing number of high roller customers. With plenty of seating for a relaxed evening, a private bar stocked with high end cocktails, and plenty of entertainment around the lounge, it'll soon repay the caps it costs to refurbish. Day 57 and Rhodes notices profits are down due to increasing service and supply costs, so it's time to expand the hotel. Floor 2 is fully repaired in the same style as Floor 1, which increases capacity massively, featuring some bigger capacity guest suites to provide a cheaper room option. Days 58 to 60 are spent fixing the lack of shopping options in the casino, so we open up the Owl of Sanctus shopping floor after extensive repairs. A large open plan floor with a number of vendors providing upscale clothing will appeal to rich customers, and plenty of areas to take a break in between browsing the options also featuring a large room which will be aimed at events. Forget drive through weddings, get married here for exorbitant costs. Day 61 and even more entertainment has opened with a museum showcasing pre-war history, with exhibits focusing on pre-war technology and items, a section dedicated to the various cities and towns that have risen from the flames, and an exhibit showing off some questionable fashion that hasn't thankfully made a return in the Mojave. 
update 62 and the engineers finally identify why the pool's water pressure is down. So we head out on a journey to the casino's water pumping station and Mr House's old mansion. After talking to the NCR and offering to help, we head into the substation identified in the casino records and proceed to clear out the Mylerk infestation. Eventually reaching the pumping station which is in need of some maintenance and with a guide to repair it, get the pump back in full working order. After a long journey back to the casino, head into the water facility and with plenty of water flowing into the building, fill the pool and start distributing free water to Freeside to assist the humanitarian effort. Day 63 and an elevator is repaired which stops a huge intact floor which features a conference room fit for a board of directors, plenty of space to incorporate officers and an eerie voice which calls out from a server room which turns out to be the casino's AI. The AI shares plans from Mr House to make the casino fully self-sufficient to decrease operating costs and mentions a group of scientists who are in hiding who could assist in the transformation. With the scientists last location marked on the map, Rhodes heads out on the road before stumbling across their town up in flames. The town was taken over by raiders and a gunfight breaks out. After a few close calls, the raiders are taken down and something in the distance catches my eye. A strange area full of greenery, something that stands out compared to the orange tint of the Mojave. Following the trail, we stumble across a bunker door and head inside to investigate. The bunker is strange and filled with technology Rhodes has never seen. Full to the brim of scientists and soldiers who point me in the direction of the leader. Commander Trimac gives a rundown on the group who identify themselves as the Enclave. And after getting rid of their old leader who was running a dictatorship, have been looking to redeem themselves. And what better way than inviting them to join the casino to push New Vegas into the future. Day 64 and after a day of setting up, we share plans with the Enclave on the setup of a botanical garden to grow food for self-sufficiency. And they get right to work setting up the basement with high-tech farming machinery and sacrificing their own rations to get the garden started. With plenty of expansion room, we can provide food to all of the surrounding areas. Day 65 and the Enclave help fix a number of robots who can increase the kitchen's efficiency so we can provide cooked meals to Freeside and improve the service of the casino. And with an influx of people living at the casino, we can finally fully staff the Skyview restaurant, turning it into a vibrant bar offering a number of fresh food and drink options. And on day 66, a floor is outfitted with high-tech banking facilities. The bank vault is protected by a number of turrets, a heavy-duty metal gate, and even a force field to keep the physical vault secure. The New Vegas Strip now has a fully secure area to keep the caps being invested into it, with the hope of more development grants being authorised. So, now there's nothing else to repair, and Rhodes can sit back and admire his work. Repairing the town of Prim, and breathing new life into a crumbling economy, taking over an abandoned casino, and rebuilding it into the place to be on the Strip, with enough activities to keep any visitor to New Vegas occupied, and even reinvigorating local areas like Freeside with free water, healthcare and food.